It might be grand, it might be smashing. I think I just made it worse. Hello, UK <laughs> Crime <laughs> I'm going to put a stop to talking to authors before we go live because I'm always just crying, laughing before we even start. Here is the, oh, utterly charming. I just think she's lovely. Marion Todd, introduce yourself, show off your books for us and then we'll get cracking. Hello everybody, I'm Marion Todd, author of the DI Claire Mackay crime series, which are police procedural books set in St Andrews in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, there are now three and three quarter books. The fourth one comes out next week on Thursday and I can let you see all four together. Go for it. I can sort of... Show there us one go. at a time, let everyone see these gorgeous covers. I wasn't prepared for this. We should have had a rehearsal. Right, here's the first book. We see them run, which a came rehearsal. out. <laughs> Don't tell them that. Right, here's book one. See them run. Oh, that was smooth. Smooth, my uh, friend. I'm getting better. Ooh, you are. Then book two is in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Book three, which I think is my favourite, but don't tell anybody, is Lies to Tell. And book four, which comes out on the 11th, which I think is a week tomorrow, so it'll be out a week on, at midnight, mm. is What They Knew. And that this is lovely fresh copy, hot off the press. Oh. And I can't wait to see people think about it well we are already getting comments so tell us about claire mckay right okay so claire is uh 30 something she's a detective inspector who was born in glasgow in scotland um and was in glasgow a firearms officer quite senior in, in firearms um unit and due to an incident that is related in See Them Run, she decided that she needed yeah. to step away from it and to um, take on a new role. So she saw a job in St Andrews as detective inspector and she applied for it and she moved through there. Um, she's, I like her. I like, well, obviously you'd have to create a character that you like. She's um, bit taller than me, a bit fitter than me, a bit younger than me. Um, she's not perfect. She makes mistakes and, and um, doesn't always you know, get, get things right. She's a bit chaotic in her home life and so on. But she's good hearted and hard working. And she's a kind of, um, I've known a lot of policemen on the right side, I would say, you know, not, not, not sort of being having my collar felt. Um, <laughs> she's a kind of uh, amalgamation of all the brilliant police people I've known because police often get a, a rough sort of time of it in the press but actually the vast vast majority of them are hard-working dedicated brilliant people who really try yeah. to do the best for the community and I've tried to um, imbue Claire with all the qualities that I've come across in the police officers I've known and that's about that's her. I um, love that that's Claire in a nutshell and that was just summed up perfectly. <laughs> yeah she's growing as i write her she grows and i think that's that would be true of anybody anybody who's created a series character mm. um she becomes more of a person um it's interesting to see reviews quite often people will say that they're enjoying learning more about claire as the books go on and that's yeah. because i'm learning about her. she couldn't fail to be shocked by the things that happen around her though that she's either directly involved in or indirectly involved in she couldn't fail to grow because this the series just wouldn't work as well as it does if she wasn't growing yeah yeah i think that's that's very uh, that's that's absolutely spot on um and there are certain stages in her life so i've got her to a stage now where she's settled in her kind of home life relationship love life kind of thing and I think I'm going to, that, that, this is me writing book five at the moment and she's quite settled. And I think I'm going to run with that for book five 
and then I might lob a grenade in for book six. I'm not sure yet. You, know? <laughs> you can... look so sweet. How can you lob a grenade in? You look look at you. You look like a bluebell could land on your bluebird could land on your shoulder at any moment. <laughs> and then you read oh. what you've written and you think, oh my word. Can't trust you oh, to well, keep you know. it simple. We all have a dark side. <laughs> As long as it's all on the page and not in practice, we're good. Oh, definitely. You know, this, this is the wonderful thing about being a crime writer. I mean, my first, you probably know this because I've told this story several times, oh. but I wrote my first novel because I really, really wanted to kill someone. I mean, badly wanted to kill them. And it's against the law. They won't let you do it. And I thought, right, OK, well, there's only one course of action here. I have to create this person in a book and um, kill them. And that's where Claire McCann. I came from because she was then brought in to investigate what was going on here. And I hated this person so much that I let the killer get away with it. So, but I never, that novel never ever was would be published. Um, I'm now mining it for parts and taking bits and characters and scenes out of it and using them elsewhere. Because there was a lot of work went into it, but it was a, a kind of a learning experience, quite cathartic as well to, um, mm get rid of this sort of this this feeling for this person who who really just needed to be smacked it's no other word for it they just needed a good off so, a cliff with with a shovel don't apparently okay so um I, I for many many years i was very happily married to a police officer and i can tell you from his knowledge and experience that the way to kill someone is off a cliff because as long as there's no witnesses, I then swear it's, it's I wasn't your planning this. Honestly, <laughs> shove, shove that. Look at that over there. Shove, and then oh, help! You're welcome. <laughs> Nobody's ever going up oh. a hill with me ever again, are they? Oh, you. <laughs> you ever, if you ever suggest hill walking as a hobby, I'll know that I've got on your nerves, and I'll just slink away. <laughs> <laughs> you have got an insane amount of comments already. So many. Okay. Um, Kaz, Caroline Maston says hello. I mean, I can see them out the corner of my eye scrolling. Oh, literally. The li there's so many. So I'm looking at them on my phone so I can see everyone's names. Now, I know that Joe Singleton has dropped his name in, but we're not quite up to you, Joe. So bear with us just for a minute Kaz wants to know are you a meticulous plotter or do you sometimes go off plot if a character forces it oh that's Lorraine Mace okay oh hold on so Caroline must have put okay. Lorraine hi look gorgeous Lorraine um she must have copied in right okay so that's from Lorraine that Kaz has very kindly copied in so thanks Kaz right. okay right super um I would say I'm 90% plotter 10% um let's see what happens um, I, I, I have to plot. Well, part of the reason I have to plot is that when you're writing a series, when you have a contract with your publisher, your editor will come to you um, and say, right, when you finish one book, what do you have planned for the next book? And they'll kind of want to know. And there's good reasons for that. It's not just that they're keeping tabs on me in case I go, you know, yeah. rogue and write something completely <laughs> different. It's so that they can start thinking about cover designs, about titles, and about how they'll promote it. Because ideally, what they want is, as they're launching one book, they want to be able to promote the next. Um, so that if anybody picks that, that book up, they can say, oh, you know, this, gosh, this is what she's going to do next. I really enjoy that. I'll pre-order that. that. That's the plan. Um, so I, I, I sleep better at night if I plot. Um, mm. And I do it using PowerPoint, which I know is quite unusual. But yeah, um, I've never I heard I of that before. No, I think I, I may have invented it. Um, <laughs> I, I take a, a slide. I use the same type of slide all the time. And um, at the top, I put the, the date or the time or the time of day, you know, so it could be Monday afternoon or something like that. Mm. And I then have a, you know, a few lines below that of what the scene is going to be. And then I think what the next scene is going to be. And I, I don't necessarily do it in a linear fashion. It can often be that I know that three days hence, this is going to happen. So gradually I fill in the blanks. And I also keep my um, reference material, the important things um, on a slide 
sort of separate slides, but they're color coded so that uh, I know that that's not part of the plot. Um, and if anything happens that Claire doesn't know about at the time, but I need to know that it's happened, um, I'll have that in there and that will be another color as well so that I, I know that, um, you know, I've not to actually say that, but I have to be aware that it's happening. Um, and that's important for things like uh, forensic investigation. It, you know, if a post-mortem has been carried out, I need to know when someone died, um, roughly, uh, so that I can, you know, it makes sense with the plot. But always, uh, well, so what I then do, sorry, I should have said, is I export the text from all the slides into Word, and I've got my ready-made plan, and that sits at the bottom of my draft, and as I type scenes, <coughs> I delete. The bit at the bottom gradually gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the, the plot, the novel gets longer. Uh, but always, always things pop up when you think, oh, that's interesting. I'll, I'll change this and I'll do that. So I do plot meticulously, but I, I can go off that. How do you make sure that you've got everything on the page that you need to? So you've got these notes that you need to know, but they don't need to be in the book yet. How do you make sure that you don't make the mistake of leaving it in your notes and thinking it's on the page for the reader? How do you balance that? I do make mistakes. <laughs> I make a lot of mistakes. Um, first of all, what I tend to do is every time I sit down to write, I read over what I've written the previous day. Okay. Um, and it, if I write a bit in the morning, which I sometimes do, not I'm, I'm an evening writer, but if I write a bit in the morning, and then come back to it in the evening, I'll read that over. And that cues me in, if you like. And it also throws up things that I hadn't realised were wrong, were mistakes. Um, but I do make mistakes. So I finish the book and I'll stick it away for a few days and then I'll start to read it again. And you then tend to spot continuity errors at that point, hopefully. That's, that's the plan. The quicker you read it, the better. Um, mm. you know, so if you can read it in a week, then you will you spot the errors. The difficulty is that I've got things in my head that I know are going to happen, and I need to remember and make them happen at the right time. Um, and then what I do is I, I read it out loud. When I've done that, that sort of main edit, I'll do a, a read out loud, and it's amazing what you pick up from that. Um, even just vocalising it, you think, wait a minute, that's, that doesn't that didn't happen. That's not right. And then finally, I, I have a fabulous editor, Louise Cullen, um, and she'll come back to me and say, oh, why is she doing that? You know, she doesn't know that yet. And I think, no, oh, you're right. She, she doesn't. <laughs> um, so hopefully between that and the, the copy editor, um, we sort of get it, you know, um, so that there's no mistakes. But I do. I make howlers. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> but Louise gets such high praise. She really oh, she's does. Fabulous. I've heard she's amazing fabulous. things. John, who works with Louise, is, is another absolute cracking editor. Um, Canelo are so mm -hmm. with their stuff, they're just fab. Well, she's actually coming to do something with us later in the year, so um, keep your eyes peeled for that. We're in negotiations. So I'm going to go back to our um, our comments and questions. We have actually got them at the side on our um, on the right hand side of the screen, but if people don't leave the names, I can't see. So I also have my uh, my phone just looking at the the comments. So Francesca Riccardi says hi. Um, from hi Fran. Um, from Tana Collins via Kaz again. Thanks Kaz. How did you get into crime fiction writing, Marion? Apologies if you've been asked this many times before. <laughs> no, not at all. Tana's another lovely writer. Um, she writes crime fiction in Fife as well, which which I do too. Um, crime fiction. Uh, I think it was genuinely that that wanting to kill that person um, yeah. that made me think because I I played around with with other types of writing and not really settled at all, um, and not really found what I wanted to write. And I found I was reading more crime, and I thought. I didn't think I could write a crime novel because I thought the plotting would be too difficult. And I didn't know how to, I maybe still don't know, how to hide 
what's you know the big reveal if you like yeah it's going to happen near the end i didn't know how to to weave that through giving the reader enough clues um but not making it obvious and i think sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't some people will say to me yeah i guess you're running good at getting that right there's a reason you know, that you're on book four and writing book five i suppose so <laughs> well that's that's kind um I think I, then I just thought, right, I'm going to give it a go. And the first novel I wrote wasn't completely uh, police procedurally. There was lots of different points of view in it, which I loved, actually. I'd really like to write that again. But I had too many. Um, and it gradually became less about the fact that there was this awful person and more about the the investigation of the crime. And, and that sort of made me think, I think I'd like to do this properly now. A, a better structured novel. Um, so that that was that's the long answer to a very short question. <laughs> that was going to be my question, actually. Why police procedurals? But obviously, you've just answered that. Well, you know, that's that's another thing. Um, when I'd finished this the second book, well, actually, when I finished the first book as well, mm. I um, found this wonderful editor, uh, a guy called Ray Banks who is also a writer, and he was just amazing. He was recommended to me. So I contacted Ray, and he had a look at the book, and he said, really, what you are writing here is a police procedural. Oh, I said, what's a police procedural? Mm -hmm. And um, he he said, well, you know, it's, it's wholly from the point of view of the detective, although I know some people vary from that. that. Um, but that's what I decided to do. And that makes it that you have to be, that's why I have to plot so carefully, because if Claire doesn't know about it, then the reader can't know about it. So yeah. they are essentially on Claire's shoulder, following her around. Um, I went to a talk in uh, Topping's bookshop in St Andrews a few years ago when we could go to talks and things like yeah. that. I remember that. And the another five writer, James Oswald, was speaking. And I, I love James's writing. Mm. He's, he's a, just a fabulous novelist. And he said, if you want to know about police, police procedurals, read the Frost novels by R.D. Bingfield, you know, the, the David Jason made famous. Yeah. And so I bought the first Frost novel and, oh my gosh, I, was, I just loved it. I was laughing out loud at Frost. He's just brilliant. What a character. Um, and that was really good advice because I just, I learned a lot, I think, by seeing how, how that was written. Um, and it's not that I'm comparing myself, to to the the writing of those novels but you do learn such a lot from reading good writing yeah absolutely do not a yeah not a shadow of a doubt and there's not a person that i know that hasn't either read the books or watched david jason in action you know it's, just, it's, it's been there's a reason it's so well known it's just it's it's fantastic and he he just inhabits the character um, he was such a good choice. I think very, very good, good TV. We're going to go straight back into <laughs> Tana Collins has commented underneath. Ah, she wanted to kill someone. Now I want to know who she wanted to kill. This is from Tana. Marion is a brilliant writer and so modest. You are so modest. I'm not going to ask you who you wanted to kill. I'm going to move on. Not all. <laughs> um, Kaz, Kaz has said that she's so jealous that um, that I get to chat to you. Caroline Maston, you have to take turns. <laughs> no, the last time I spoke to Caroline Maston, my shower was leaking into the room. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Kaz if she remembers the drip. Fingers crossed that we've not got that tonight. Oh, my word. Where? <laughs> Because my son had had um, been away, I don't know, hill walking or something for the day. Mm. And he'd come back and we were going out to dinner. And I said, now, come in before seven o'clock or six o'clock, whatever it was. Don't make a noise. So he tiptoed in, in time. That was fine. All good. And then he said, I'll just go and have a shower. OK. And then I hear this drip, drip, drip. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry. That's brilliant. She's never told me that. We do have a bit of um, discretion. Whatever happens with our authors that we're chatting to stays between us, you know, the, kind of the before and after. I mean, the live bit, obviously, that, that's not, but she's never told me, so that's uh, that's hilarious. Well, um, you can hear it. If you listen to the interview, it's quite clear. 
<laughs> um, Melanie Hello, Pittman says hi. Please. Sorry, go on. Sorry, who says hi? Melanie I, I just said I was trying to. So she's, um, I believe Melanie's in, I believe America. Correct me if I'm wrong, Melanie. Hi, nice to meet Hi, you. Hi, Melanie. Hi, for tuning in. Um, Joe Singleton. See, we get there in the end. I mentioned his name earlier on. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Um, oh, he, he can't make it tonight, but he hopes we both have a great event and he'll um, look for the recording tomorrow and send love to us both. So that's lovely. Thank you. Oh, Louise Cullen says hello. Speak of the devil. Hi, Louise. <laughs> I tell everybody how wonderful you are. She knows. She, she's her. She knows she's fabulous. Um. So Melanie Pittman says new author for her. Nice to meet you. And Lucy Thank Sampson's you. watching. She says good evening to us both. Hi, Lucy. Hello. <laughs> And um, Patsy, Patricia Forsyth, Forsyth says hi as well. Um, Wendy H. Hi, Jones, um, what are your favourite oh. books to read? I actually need to message you, Wendy. So if you are watching, send me a message because we've got um, a prize to send to you. So that's from something else, but we'll, um, we'll go to that. But I've got a prize for Wendy. So what are your favourite okay. books to read? Okay. Um, my absolute all time favourite books are not crime books at all. Um, mm -hmm. They're the Matt Lucia novels by E.F. Benson. Okay. And there's only about six of them. And there's a couple of um, sort of tribute novels have been written by a guy called Tom Holt. And they're, they're sort of comedy of manners set in probably 1920s, 1930s, uh, southeast England, sort of Hastings type, type area. And it's tiny things that happen. It's just about the dynamics and the, the sort of small people politics in a, a kind of small village and these um, magnificent women who are vying to run the village um, and they're just they're very well observed very funny and they're my my sort of go-to relaxing novels good good um <laughs> joanne fairbrother hi joanne she hi, says joanne. Um, you capture the atmosphere of st andrews so well during lockdown, oh, I felt I had travelled there again. That's so lovely. That's a lovely thing to say. Thank you so much. And um, Victoria Dowd. Hi, Victoria. I love Victoria Dowd. Oh, Hi, this sounds brilliant. A new book for the pile. Four new books for the pile, Victoria. Four. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can't keep a small oh, in pile. My, in my defence, in my defence, um, see them run. Is currently free on Amazon, oh. as in no money. Um, Have you so shared this offer in the book club? Probably not, because why have you not shared <laughs> this in the book club? Cows, if you watch, and please can you put that in the book club? <laughs> I promise I'll do it tonight. I just haven't had a blue minute. One um, of the admins so that's who's watching true. will put that in the book club. That oh, needs, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely need to promote that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a bargain. It is a plumbing bargain. Yeah. <laughs> Give us a go on. Sell it a bit. Give a heads up to anybody who See might be interested. Mm. Okay. Um, I don't know how that you drink out... this to, to a small synopsis. I don't know how you do it, so I'm intrigued. Synopses are horrible to write. Okay, um, See Them Run is a, a revenge type book. Um, a wedding, it opens at a wedding and one of the wedding guests is enticed out for what he thinks is going to be a bit of a liaison. That's pre-watershed, so that's what I'm going to say. Liaison, yeah. And you know, down, down the drive from the hotel, it's out in the country and he sees the lights of a car and he thinks, whoa, well, oh, here we go. This is my this is my date. And the car sort of revs the engine. He's getting very excited. And then suddenly the car revs again and hits him and runs over him. And then it backs over him again and kills him. And uh, off it goes into the night. I shouldn't. I should have a very solemn face, but I know what happens. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> and then... and. 
the, to make matters a little bit complicated, because I like a puzzle, there's a card, a white card with number five written on it, found on his body. <laughs> okay. And Claire doesn't really know why. She thinks it's maybe something to do with a wedding or whatever, you know, she's not sure. And then I think it's the next night, um, a local businessman is run down in his, uh, in his drive just outside. He's out walking the dog last thing at night and um, he's hit by a car. And it's thought to be a hit and run until they discover there's a number four card on his body. And Claire realises that it, there's a countdown and it goes from there. Oh. So it was such fun to write. Really, I really enjoyed writing that. Quite good. You thought it was lovely to write. I mean, obviously, it's fantastic to read, but you were but, quite okay, sinister, so my love. There's a bit in it that I, I wasn't looking forward to writing and I okay. didn't particularly enjoy writing it. Um, but I'm quite a I'm quite a wuss when it comes to you know I don't do gory bits um, mm. or anything or anything that's really unpleasant. But this had to be in; it needed to be in, and I hope I've done it reasonably sensitively. Um, that's for the reader to judge. But I tried my best. Uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't say and and being. It's how to word things carefully. I would say you yeah. absolutely managed what you set out to achieve. I, it's the I only way so. I can say I, it without giving anything away. Yeah, I, know, I hate I know, spoilers, I and I'm so aware of everything that comes out of my mouth. I would love to know if people have a view on that. I'd be very, okay. very happy to hear. Things. Even if they say, you know what, that was a wee bit, I, I, I wish you hadn't you know, done this or that and the next thing. All feedback is useful because it all gets fed in and, and sort of percolates around and and I, I take it on board. Sometimes it's quite funny. You'll get, I, I had two lots of contradictory feedback just within days. Hmm. Um, and one was, gosh, I really love all the detail. You know, it's, it's so interesting to know what, um, you know, this looks like. And actually, I'd like a bit more detail. I'd like to know what Claire looks like and stuff like this. And then, then a couple of days later, oh my gosh wading through all this detail just give me the plot that's i just want to know what happens <laughs> you can't win you can't win i think you just have to be happy and yeah write the book that you yeah. want to read yeah it's, yeah that is the best advice ever isn't it write what you want to read don't try and fit don't, don't try and second guess what's going to be popular or uh, obviously you have to have a nod to what's commercial and what will mm. sell, but um, don't try and mould your book to be the next Ian Rankin or the next Val McDermott or, or whatever is your poison. Um, write the book that is is yours, that, that you feel you can identify with. I think there's a tricky thing with um, starting, and it's the place where I am. I think you think that anything that you find interesting that other people might not, and you've got to be able to get past that block. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've got, sorry, a dog has just appeared at my knee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, yeah. It's, it's, sometimes I'll write a scene and I'll think, oh, that's just awful. Um, so I leave it in and, and I usually come back to it cold, maybe a few days later, it might be a few weeks later, um, or it might be the next morning. And if I, and sometimes I'm quite surprised. I think, actually, yeah, no, that is okay. And other times I think, it's just nonsense. It's rubbish. It doesn't read well. It's self-indulgent claptrap. Take it out. But it's hard to take anything out. It really is. Because you think, what if I change my mind again? It's a tricky one. So what would you do in that situation? Would you change colour and leave it in to come back to and look again? Or do you take it out and put it somewhere I, I, for later? I, I use uh, I write in Word, so oh. I use the highlight tool because it's the quickest. Yeah. Um, and I've got quite a lot of bits highlighted in the book that I'm writing just now where I just think, I know I can say that better, or I'm not sure about that. So I just put a massive, great yellow highlight over it. Um, and then when I come back to it, I, I sort of look at it again. And sometimes you're surprised. You think, actually, it's okay. And a lot of times you think, yeah, you were dead right. Get it out. <laughs> Got so many we've 
we've got loads of comments and questions. Um, Isabel, now bear with me. Isabel Bliskal, Bliskal, forgive me, Isabel, if I'm getting any part of that wrong. Do you live vicariously through some of your characters? And if so, which ones and why? Oh. Benji. <laughs> Um, I, I look after my daughter's dog, who's currently sitting at my my knee just now, and he is he's a he's a thug. He's like a drunk man. You know, you take him out for a walk, and he's like, "Who can I fight with?" Rawr, rawr, kind of, and then he runs away. Um, so um, I gave Claire a dog, and I made Benji a little bit badly behaved sometimes. So in the book that's just about to come out, what they knew. Benji's going to dog training. Um, and this is taken from experiences I had attempting to take our dog to dog training. And the, the one thing that makes him freak out is the presence of other dogs. Oh. So everything that happens in the dog training scenes, apart from maybe um, one thing, happened to me. Uh, so oh, I thought, no. right, I'm going to purge myself. And, and in it goes. Um, Claire, yes, I sort of make Claire very fit. You know, she runs really well and and she's taller than me. I, I would really like to be tall and I'm not. So, you know, yes, I, I do. I, How um, tall are you? I am five foot two and a half. And don't forget the half. <laughs> so I'm just a wee sport. I swear, I absolutely swear that I used to be five foot two and a half. And I'm five foot. You never are. Hmm. No, I, I did used to stand on things to see what it would like to be taught, be like to be taller, but I didn't care for it. I'm quite happy being short. All to right, I'd just like to be about as a kid. I, I, I'd go for two and a half inches and I'd like thicker hair. And yeah, um, hair. Oh, don't get me started. Anyway, that's another <laughs> that's another <laughs> interview. Um what else would I like? I'm pretty content, actually. I'm pretty content. But it'd be nice to be just a wee bit bigger. Mm. Put me on it like a kind of, you know, if you ironed me, then you'd get rid of all the sort of lumps and bumps and I'd be nice and willowy. Iron. And <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm five foot. I'm quite happy. I am. I have worked in, I work in a primary school and at the moment I'm in the infants, so I seem quite tall to these little teeny yeah, tiny tops. But yeah. I have been in year three with a child the same height as me. Yes. I worked yeah. in a school as well. Makes you less threatening if you're the same height. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what were you what were you saying? I think I worked in a school as well for a few years and um it's amazing the difference in heights of children in the same year even. Mm. Yeah, my children blame me for being short. Not that the dad's particularly well, tall, but you know. <laughs> well, the best things come in small parcels, they do say. And things that, um, oh, there's a saying, and I've forgotten halfway through it, but um, good. some things don't take as long to get to the perfection. Oh, I like that. I've said it wrong, but the general gist is there. <laughs> To use that. Claire will say that. <laughs> um, ah, Kaz has said nice bookmarks, Sam. So I'm going to give the book club and David, who sorted these out, a little plug. So here, and my bookshelf as well. Melanie Pittman wanted to see my bookshelf. So this is and the back of the UK Crime Book Club bookmarks. Fantastic. These are so, great. I am happy to send you some if you would like some. Um, David sent us, um, you know, a, a parcel of them. So I'm more than happy to send you some, Marion. <laughs> it's oh, fabulous. He's a good lad. He is, isn't he? Bless him. Don't tell him. He's a Yorkshireman. He doesn't like this, but we do think he's rather bloody marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, Pat said she loved to see them run. So me and Pat, if you remember, we started it at the same time. Yep, yeah, I remember so, um, talking about that. We yeah. yet to discuss them, but Pat, I'll be in touch. 
<laughs> Mind you, you guys read voraciously. I'm so impressed. I love it. I am um, the best thing. I have oh, ordered some I'm milk so wine this week as well. You've what done, sorry? Ordered some non crime this week as well. So I bought, I've actually got Ooh. one here. So this one. Uh huh. Oh, mm. that looks interesting. So the five people you meet in heaven, I read that years ago and loved it. I've not read it since. I lent it to my friend. Hi, Sarah. And um, never got it back. <laughs> so Sarah. then I found out. I know. Then I found out there was a sequel, but I've always wanted to read Cheese Days with Maury. So I can't. There you go. I've Great. heard about it on different TV shows. So um, I sent Kaz a couple of a copy of the Five People You Meet in Heaven. They're not crime. There's something a bit different, but generally, as you can see from all the Billinghams and the Marion Todds and the oh. Who have I got? Simon McCleave. I've got Will Templeton right up here. You know, I mean, there's, I can't. Sorry, everyone that I'm missing. You all know who's on my shelves by this point. So, um, yeah, crime is my huge passion. But throw in a bit of Mitch Alban and Cecilia O'Hearn and I'm a happy girl. Fantastic. <laughs> Let's go back to your questions. I've gone right off track. <laughs> Ah, Kaz wants to know, can we serious stalkers buy, si buy signed copies from you? I genuinely don't know. Um, that's a good question because um, obviously I don't, you know, I get, I get sent off their copies um, mm. and, and I have, you know, one or two, but um, I, I, don't, I don't know how I would go about that. Maybe, maybe um, some from Canelo can help if they're listening. How about we leave I, that one with you and we can always do a post? Yeah, I, I genuinely don't know. I'd be happy to to kind of, if I possibly could, but um, I, other than me going to a bookshop, signing them and posting them, I'm not quite sure how that would work. I shall take that up with my publisher. And I shall give you permission to share that in the book club once you find an answer. I will do. Thank you. <laughs> um, Melanie Pittman says she's love. she'd love to buy a signed copy. <laughs> and oh, she you. says um, she'd have a whole series to write about wanting to kill someone. Ha ha, love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll take, you know, I'll take orders if you like. If there are people <laughs> you want taken down. A name, bit of a synopsis, bit of a reason why, and then you can factor that in somewhere. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, so we've we've moved on quite a way from people. So Pat's saying that she's got the first three books, which um, so she's bought. See them run in plain sight, lies to tell, which are I was just trying to look how to get out of the way of them. Tried to stagger them so you can kind of see the titles. Everything was falling yeah, off the shelf. Yeah. I'm very good at knocking stuff off the top shelf, you see. So it's excellent product placement. I can't. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, Ian Miller says this is excellent advice. I'm sure it is, Ian, but we don't know which bit because he commented about half an hour ago. So you had lots yeah. of good advice. Everything I say is excellent, Ian. Just take it as absolutely. Francesca Riccardi says, that's good to know. Cheers, Marion. Again, we're half an hour on, so I'm not quite sure, it's but, good time. but we agree. <laughs> Lucy says, thanks to you. Kaz says, she looks so sad, and then we hear that. I wonder if it's something to do with a cliff. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch that. That broke up a wee bit. Kaz said, she looks so sweet, and then we hear that. So I'm wondering if it was something to do with a cliff. Could have been. <laughs> it's not like I said it from the witnesses or anything. Tony Millington says he's writing down advice. We take um we accept no responsibility for what you do with this advice, Tony. <laughs> that advice on uh, how to murder someone or or how to write about it, Tony. I mean, I'm just saying. Mm, no cliff walking with you or Tony. Just remember no, that. No. 
Oh, no, I hope there's not an epidemic of cliff murders now. It's all be my fault. Honestly, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't try this at home. Cover zip. <laughs> um, so Kaz was saying that she copied some of the questions over. Thanks, Kaz. And she said Thank sometimes you. she helps. She's fantastic. She's an absolute superstar, is Caroline Maston. She said, your plotting you. is legendary. And she said, nice mug, Sam. So Kaz sent me this for my birthday. I, why don't you ask Sam what's in her mug? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, honest bottled water. Of course. Not tonight, it's not. No, it's lager this evening. Show us your glass, Marion, if you're going to out me. You can join me. <laughs> I'm having a cheeky beer tonight. It's very nice. It was but, very, very um, dull before. I, I, no, I don't think it was. I really don't. Um, <laughs> it was. Oh, is that Benji? I can hear Benji grumbling. <laughs> the dog. Shh. He's got a ball. He wants me to... Oh, bless. he's got. Terrible time. Hello, hello. He's got terrible timing. He wants me to throw the ball now. Throw it. Throw it. We can answer okay. questions in between. Come on. Okay, leave the ball. Thank you. Oi. There we go. Right. Excellent. Um, Ian Miller says, Can we have a tune later? Um, only if you throw money at me, Ian. <laughs> and, and you need to get your earplugs out. <laughs> I'm a bit rusty. <laughs> So tell us about the link with the piano in your previous jobs for anyone who missed you last time talking about it. Right. Um, well, for many years, I was a piano teacher, which was great. It was, it was a nice thing to do. Um, and I did a lot of accompanying um, singers and, and uh, I played yeah. with a, a group for 10 years as well. Uh, but the most fun was when I was the pianist in a hotel lounge in the bar. And I used to do, uh, there was two of us actually, we, we alternated, we would do Friday and Saturday nights. And um, it was actually really good for a writer because I, I can sit and play, because I've played for you know donkey's years, mm -hmm. I can sit and play without really thinking about it. And it was a, it, just quite the worst piano I've ever played in my life actually, it was shocking. But what, what was good about it was it was a baby grand, which means it has a nice flat top, as opposed to the one behind me, which is an upright. Um, the uprights have their strings up and down the way. Baby grand and big grand have their strings flat. And so I just I was learned to... the difference. Okay. There you go. Now, if you're buying a piano, boys and girls, and it's an upright, look inside to see if the strings crisscross because that's better than if they're just uh, straight up and down, because they're longer, as you know, if you know your Pythagoras, you know that diagonals are longer. So you get a better sound from longer strings. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry, okay. where were we? Um, so because it was a baby grand, I could look over the top and see everything that was going on. And I was in the corner of a sort of um, L. I was right, so I could see kind of, going into dinner and people coming out to dinner and observe the dynamics and um, and sometimes it would be a bit rowdy you'd get maybe a, a football team in if they were playing in it was in Dundee if they were playing a match in Dundee the next day they might stay the night in the hotel um, and that would be quite interesting as well just watching them and then there was the staff who for whom I was a bit of an oddity I think so they would come out from time to time and just have a look um, and, and then they put me in the dining room for a while, which is a completely different experience uh, because people are much more formal when they're dining. Uh, mm. So the whole thing was, was just meat and drink for a writer. There was just, you would look at someone and you would think, right, what's going on with you? That's really interesting. I'm going to remember your face and, and do something with that. And then um, they replaced me with a flat screen TV. What do you think about that? Isn't that shocking? That's horrendous it gets worse I turned up for my shift one Saturday night and the TV was there and it was showing a football match and it was in the middle of a wedding um, and in Scotland it, when you have a wedding what you tend to have is um, 
a reception type, a, a meal and drinks and things in the afternoon. And then there'll be a bit of a hiatus about six o'clock or so until the band turn up or disco or whatever you're going to have. Oh. And then evening guests will come along um, to make it an even bigger party from about sort of eight, eight o'clock to midnight. So this was this in-between time of the wedding and everybody was trotting around in their heels and their hats and everything and getting very, very drunk. And all the men were collected in front of this flat screen TV, which was right next to the piano. And nobody appeared to switch it off, although I asked if it could be switched off. And I thought, well, you know, if they, if they do switch off, I'll be the most hated person in the, uh, the room. So I thought, well, you know what? I'm here. I want to be paid. So I sat and played the piano. <laughs> So they had football with me tinkling, you know, playing a bit of bar Bacharach or uh, sort of um, George Gershwin in the background. I thought, I don't care, I want my money. Yeah. And um, the last shift I did, I didn't go back after that. I, I don't thought, blame you. Yeah. How rude. Well, I don't you know, know what to happen. do with that story, my word. <laughs> there was another party I was booked to play where it was a private party in a house. and. It was a surprise for the, I think it was a 30th or a 40th birthday. The, the, the birthday girl didn't know I was coming. Oh. So I drove and kind of walked at the door and um, I was kind of quite nicely dressed because, you know, I thought I'm going to sit in this piano in this private room and, and all the rest of it. And I turned up and uh, they opened the door and they said, oh, let, let's go and get her. And they brought this, this woman in and uh, they said, they pointed at me and they said, this is your birthday present. And she said, oh my God, you're a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, however, I did not play the piano. <laughs> so, okay. you, you, when, you're, when you're something like a, a waitress or a, a you know a, a bar person or a pianist, people don't notice you unless you're doing something they're particularly interested in. So they just carry on misbehaving, and you're just sitting taking it all in. So. I have a feeling they may have noticed you if you'd gone in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Composed cell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Ellie Seymour has said, Hi, Marion. Lovely Hi, to Ellie. see you. <laughs> She's asked two questions. Do you ever get writer's block? And if so, how do you deal with it? Is the first question. And secondly, oh, how many words a day do you write? And how do you structure your writing day? Mm. Okay. Um, I would say I get plotter's block rather than writer's block. Once oh, I've that's done interesting. My... Yeah. Um, I spend probably almost as long plotting as I do writing. Plotting a novel will take me a good month. And most of that's done walking the dog or or just kind of doing stuff in the house and then I'll go back to the computer and quickly type up some notes. Oh. Um, so the plotting, I can get blocked. You know, I'm starting to think, because I'm about two thirds of the way through writing book five at the moment, there's a little voice in the back of my head saying, what's book six? And I know that when I finish book five, you forget how hard it is. You forget when you, because by the time you've finished a book, you're writing so fast because you know everything that's happening. You just want to get it out. Hmm. And that, that kind of fluidity is, is a wonderful part of writing. It's a great experience. And then suddenly you're starting again. You think, I don't know what this is about. Um, so I would say, yes, I get, I get blocked. And what I tend to do is I'll go for a walk and I'll talk to myself a lot and talk to the dog. Um, and I'll just speak my ideas out loud and, and see how they, they, they sort of go. And some of them make it in and some of them don't. But I do have a big, big document that's about nine pages, which is separated into um, headings. So there's crimes, criminals, setting, techniques, um, red herrings, uh, character traits, things like that. And when something occurs to me, if I see something on telly, I think, oh, I'll just add that to my document. So I'll take that document out when I'm about to start book six and I'll see what, what I fancy, what, what kind of strikes a chord. Um, so that's, I tend not to get write, writer's blog. I don't like starting a book, I find that really hard work, um, just getting it going, getting into it, and getting to know the characters. 
Uh, but I think that's not really block, that's just a disinclination to, to work hard. Words a day, I don't know. Um, I try to do between five and 10,000 a week, but that varies hugely. And at the start, it's, it's really hard going. It's you know, grinding, scrabbling for every word. I can end up writing 500 words in a day, which is awful. When it's going very well, I can write between, I, I would like to write a thousand every day. That, oh. that would be the minimum. Um, and I like to write 7,000 a week if I can. Um, but it's, it's topsy-turvy. It's not always, I don't sit down at the same time every day to write. But I, do, I do write in the evenings. And when I finish this interview, I'll, I'll have a cup of tea and then I'll get down to do a couple of hours writing. Um, and then I'll feel a bit, I'll feel happier knowing that I've done a bit. Um, so between one and 2,000, I would say, is ideal for me, maybe five days a week, but not always the same five days. How at what point did you figure out that um, evenings were better for you? Is there a reason that that came about, or that's just, just how it is? Lazy. You know, I don't like getting up in the morning, and I don't like sort of getting my brain going in the morning. Um, and I'm always conscious that the dogs sort of wanting to go out, and if I've got things to do, like appointments or whatever, I try and make them in the morning. Um, so sometimes if I if I sort of before I take the dog out, I'll maybe sit down for half an hour and have a think. But I work better. I'm a night owl. You know, I, I could write long into the night. Um, it's only sort of having to be up in the morning for the dog that, that kind of makes me go to bed. I could easily write till two o'clock, but I usually stop at midnight. Midnight is I can't remember the last time I was awake at midnight. Really? Of course, you're working in a school. You've got to be up an atom, haven't you? Yeah, I suppose um, that's, I, um, that's fair enough. I'm not... If you asked me, I would probably have said I'm a night owl, but when I think about it, no. Circumstances I, I'm just, mean I, otherwise. <laughs> we have got... We've only got five minutes left, and we've got quite a few comments and things to whip through. So, are we ready? We are. Brace yeah. yourself. Francesca Riccardi said Louise is fabulous, which Louise Cullen, your editor, has um, oh, one of those little emojis back with the little hearts all around the face. Um, she said Marion's books are pristine, in pristine condition when they reach me. She's wonderful. That's from Louise. She's oh, very lovely. kind and, and lovely. Um, Charlotte McFall says hi. Hi, Charlotte. Uh, eagerly awaiting uh, Charlotte's book. Charlotte's been busily squirrelling away on her debut, so hopefully we'll see that soon. Um, Joanne Fairbrother oh. asks, who also writes books based in Fife? She's wondering. Sorry, say that again, Joanne. Has asked, who also writes books based in Fife? That's her question. Oh. Right. Tana Collins writes uh, Fife based. Hers is slightly further down, more like what we call the East Nuke, the fishing villages. Um, uh, and, oh God, scrabbling for the name. Frank, is it Frank Muir? Okay. No, T.F. Muir. T.F. Muir, he writes St. Andrew's based crime as well. And I'm sure there's someone else I've forgotten. Val McDermott has, uh, one of her novels is set in St. Andrew's. Um, a distant, the distant echo, a distant echo, and it's going to be made into a TV series, which is really exciting for the area. I'm, I'm completely distracted by Benji growling at you. Throw the ball, Maria. <laughs> I'll throw the ball, right? Okay, sorry. Carry on with the questions. Um, <laughs> Louise asks. Uh, oh, Jodie Grace says, honestly, Marion is the loveliest lady ever. No argument here. Oh. You are absolutely gorgeous. Louise Cullen says, Marion, if you were going to write novels set in a location other than St Andrews, where would that be and why? It's putting you on the spot, Ooh. unless she knows something that I don't. No, she does not, but she's putting ideas in my head. Um, two places come immediately to mind. It would have to be someplace I know, I think. Um, I wouldn't want to upset locals by getting something really wrong. Um, mm. So the first thing that comes to my head is Dundee. I was born and brought up in Dundee, which is just 
sort of five miles from me and I'm, I go there regularly. Um, or I used to go there regularly, I don't go anywhere now. Um, yeah. I know Dunlop, a working class town with a great heart. And But there's a good few mm -hmm. writers, Wendy H. Jones, who was in tonight, Wendy writes Dundee crime novels and um, a few other people as well, names escape me at the moment. So Dundee would be one. But the other one is, is I used to, for many, many years, took my children away at Easter for a week to a little highland village called Blair Athol. It's just beautiful. And we always rented the same house and we always did the same walks. It's where they learned to hill walk and, and sort of use a map and navigate and all the rest of map and compass. And I love Blair Athol so much. It's my happy place. And I would love to, I keep thinking I'll send Claire up there for some reason, but it's just a bit far. It's about an hour and a half away. Although I've just sent her to Glasgow. Um, but I'd love to set one in Highland Perthshire because it's so pretty. It really is. Come to Perthshire, it's beautiful. Um, Joanne Fairbrother says, I called my son Ben. Um, love a book with a dog character. Oh, I, me too, actually. Me too. Benji was an accident. I didn't know he was going to have he was going to be there. Um, and then Claire's sort of investigating a body and there's a there's a, a dog running around, so there's nobody in the house to look after the dog, so they take it back to the station. And uh, that was Benji. Hmm. Kaz says, I'm not short, but I have to stand on something to be the same height as the hubster, same height as the hubster. Now, Kaz isn't short, but James is tall. So what on it are we standing on? Chairs? Are we standing on a ladder? What are we standing on, Kaz? Um, Isabel says, I loved your answer to my question. Thank you. And I did pronounce the name correctly. So that's, thank you, Isabel. Um. Francesca says we can sort something out with sign copies. So between the two oh, of you, we Bob, can um, you, put a post up, tag Brilliant. me in it to say that I've approved it. Um, and Patricia Forsyth, we, we love Pat. Uh, maybe marrying... Oh, she's so lovely. Yeah, she said maybe when it, the lockdown's over, we could meet in Dundee. Hope I'm invited, Patsy. Oh, <laughs> um, that would just be lovely. And Francesca says that was about pushing someone off a cliff. So I'm looking, I'm scrolling back to see what the comment was from Francesca. <laughs> no, it's Francesca. Francesca. No, cheers, Marion. Oh, oh my word. Reference, yeah. Don't, don't mess with her. <laughs> um, Tony Millington said both. I'm not quite sure. To, oh, geez. We've given him ideas. Stop it, Tony. Slap your hands. Behave. <laughs> um, oh, we've got so many. Pat says, people watch. I was a bar a barmaid. Yes, I know people. It must have been so much fun sitting at the piano, watching people. It really you was. Must have I so many things curled away. Oh, yeah. Somebody came up to me one night, I must have obviously been, you know, kind of like mm, watching someone when I was playing. And they said to me, that was a lovely tune, what were you playing? And I thought, I have no idea. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm so busy being nosy. <laughs> oh, so Pat says her husband, who is um, who was Brian, and I used to run a whole Montrose. One night, no receptionist, so I was cook and receptionist. Not funny when cutting liver in your whites and someone wants a room and you have to explain. <laughs> yeah, that's your story and we'll speak into it. Holy moly. And on that note, <laughs> we are going to end. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I've had such a lovely time. <laughs> that has absolutely flown. It just disappeared. It's really I kept looking down and 20 minutes at a time had just gone. Give us a Where's final recap, a final recap of all of the book covers so everybody knows what they're right. looking for. Go for it. Book one, see them run. Look at the professionally done, just smoothly done. Like chocolate. Book two, in plain sight. Book three is lies to tell. I love this cover. I love, I love the little splash of red. Oh, yes. 
And book four, which is Fabi, the cover, is what they knew. I should know that, shouldn't I? Clearly what Marion didn't know. That's St Andrews there in the background. Isn't it gorgeous? Beautiful. Um, so, so there you go. That's them. And if anybody does read them, then thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us tonight. I've had an absolutely, oh, just I've loved this evening. So thank you for fun. coming to see us. And we will see you for book five. Yeah, yeah, I'm going back to book five now when, when I sign off. I'm going to wait to read what I wrote yesterday because I haven't written at all today. Um, so there'll be a lot of yellow highlighting time. <laughs> Well, don't forget to pop that post in tomorrow um, with how people can order books from you. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll have to be tomorrow, and whenever you do. Whenever you do, is okay. fine. And I'll pop it to the website about being free as well. I think it's for a week, so um, it might end about the 9th, so maybe get in, in quickly. Um, yeah, it, go for it, enjoy. Thank you so much, and I can't wait to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.